All right, we're back again. I'm going for what I call the more Christian Slater look. You know, I'm kind of losing a lot of my hair. I wish I'd went for it a couple years ago, but I got the little sideburns, not the big sideburns. I can't do the Elvis sideburns like what I used to wear in my youth. Uh, they don't quite look as well on my fat face, and because my face is fat, it spreads the hair out, so you need a lot of hair before you can actually cover some of the face. I always look like I'm uh, unshaven uh, rather than having a beard even when I got a full beard. That's the consequence of becoming fat. Anyway, uh, because I freed up a little more storage space, I want to talk to you a little more about my book. Let's try not to ding it up a little bit. These, these copies cost... $30 more or less just to print and ship. So these are going to be some very expensive books. Uh, I should probably get a, so another re-release of the old classic uh, paperback, uh, which will be eh, about $10 all cheaper than what this one's going to be. This is a $40 book, uh, conservatively. You know, I could probably sell it for $50 and it'd be well worth it. This is a very unique book. Almost no one else has put together a book like this, and I know because I wanted one like this. That's why I made it. That's why it's. I go by the uh, Thomas Edison example of find a need and fill it. In this case, I had a need. I had questions unanswered. This is the sequel to the first book that I did with Walt Cross because uh, Walt and I co-authored that one. I drew. I made the drawings. I have a little bit of commentary later on. I and I actually I'll show you that one too. I released a new special edition version of the original book, which is actually now my favorite book because of the way, because uh, of how I modified the drawings. Uh, Walt laid down the format, and he also gave his commentary on a lot of the um, on a lot of the material. You know, he is a uh, uh, he is a I'm trying to, he has a degree, he has a history degree in, in history, and he's a veteran of Vietnam, and uh, he's very extensive, he's extensively well re researched and official. I gave it a very official uh, feel to the book. At the same time, we disagreed on a few things, and uh, he didn't want to include all of the Im all the same images that I wanted to put into these. So some of the ones you see here, uh, let's see if we'll find it. Uh, you know, eventually, uh, even in this book, I was afraid to use certain images that he didn't like because I didn't want to piss him off. Uh, he's such a valuable friend and an excellent resource. But that's one of the that's one of the painful things that comes with collaboration is that sometimes you'll disagree. This image was actually a drawing I did of the Lindbergh baby for inspiration. It's actually supposed to be uh, Clara Blinn's baby boy who was bashed over a tree by the Indians after she was shot. Well, she was shot in the head and the Indians bashed her child over a tree upon the approach of Custer's men at the Battle of Washita. There are some who think that um, Major Elliot uh, uh, had, um, had died while... Uh, almost on a rescue mission to free Clara Blinn, how he would have known where she was or if she, he would have spotted her. Uh, Elliot, after Custer's initial assault on the village at the Battle of Washita, which in which he lost no more than you know five men or less, as far as I know, and only five men or less were wounded, as far as I know. One of them, I think uh, his brother got wounded in the hand, like the thumb or something, you know, T Captain Tom Custer. And then uh, the, the biggest, the, the most, um, I'd say, political, the most famous loss at the Battle of Washita from the soldier's side was, uh, aside from Elliot, who we'll get to in a moment, was uh, Captain Lewis B. Hamilton, who was the grandson of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he got shot uh, by the Indians, and, you know, they, you know, Custer caught a shit storm for letting him get killed, which, you know, you, you don't have any control over who gets to live or die. You know, everyone takes the same risk, including Custer himself which is a fact that I like to remind people of, uh, you know, whenever I get into these kind of debates is that Custer took the same risks as his men. He always took those kinds of risks. And he parted ways from McClellan's earlier way of thinking in that he, uh, um, he took on a far more aggressive uh, strategy. McClellan liked to take his time. He liked to, uh, um, what's that word that Custer's accused of not doing? Recon! 
Uh, McClellan liked to ex excessively recon. He always thought he was being lured into a trap. What we eventually found the reality to be, though, upon you know doing any serious research into the Civil War, is that McClellan, for one thing, he was highly praised by Robert E. Lee. George Brenton McClellan was considered the best Union general of the war, according to Robert E. Lee. Maybe it's because Robert E. Lee was winning you know, during the early phases of the war. But in all fairness, uh, McClellan nearly captured Robert E. Lee at the Battle of Antietam, which was a highly successful battle, and it was a Union victory, in which uh, McClellan, uh, the Union, held the field, and they, they sent Lee on on the scramble and Lee was rescued by another officer who was the former boyfriend or one of the guys um, courting McClellan's wife and I think it was A.P. Hill. Uh, there's a famous reenactor who was in you know, some of the movies like Gods and Generals. It was either Gods and Generals or it was Gettysburg and he makes a whole career out of being a living historian for A.P. Hill. This by the way is one of my favorite images of George Armstrong Custer. I call it the flash of death image. You get kind of a brief, let's see if we can get a good, you get a, you get a little bit of a glint of his skull. I did some great work on his saber down here and he's riding with the reins in his teeth, which is one of the things that um, General Philip uh, Watts Kearney, was it Watts? I think maybe his brother was Stephen Watts Kearney. Anyway, General Philip Kearney, uh, before he was, you know, killed, and, you know, he was known to ride with the, the reins in his teeth because he had one arm, so he could use the other arm to still fight, you know. Uh, General Kearney is considered to be one of the officers that Lincoln considered replacing McClellan with, uh, and he was called Kearney the Magnificent. And I haven't done a whole lot of research on Kearney, but, you know, we hear nothing but good things. He was a war hero. He was shot, uh, you know, before he could uh, undo the um, the great the mass hesitation that McClellan was routinely guilty of, of uh, this is one of those uncomfortable images that Walt didn't like. It's one of the atrocities that the Cheyenne did, uh, and it was you know sticking the uh, babies up on the tree by the knife. They, you know, uh, um, I don't know if they did it at this battle in particular, but it was. Actually, I believe they did. Well, my friend Joe is pretty up, up to speed on this sort of thing. But they'd take a knife, they'd stick it up uh, the chin of the of the child, and if it was you know small enough, they'd hang it from a tree and feed it from the, to the birds. And so this image, you know, you might consider this a little bit uh, uh, almost like propaganda because I don't know exactly what it looked like. I don't know if Black Kettle specifically insisted on this, but it was a Cheyenne. Uh, mutilation. I call it Black Kettle's Bird Feeders. And I kind of screwed up this image later on. This is an older version of the image. It's the best image I still had available. And it obviously looks good, but you know, I modified this one, got a little more detail, and it's shown on the previous to pay, page. This one, but this is the older image. And it's the, these babies with the knives stuck in their. Uh, their 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 chins and hung from trees and fed to the birds it's called black kettles bird feeders uh not something that walt wanted to include on the original book but something i include here on this book because it's my book so i uh, uh, this time lead the way i don't want to lose the support of walt because he is a fantastic researcher and uh, his work is comprehensive he has been nothing but kind to me uh, but, you know, like I said, it, we have different different matters of taste. I had to really show him this book before I think he got comfortable with this book because I think he thought I was going to challenge some of his conclusions, and I did not want to appear that way at all. I, what I did uh, want to do was I had a lot I wanted to get off my chest because I personally wrote this book, and this book uh, was a, or back to the image I left up left off on on the previous page. This baby is supposed to be Clara Blinn's young child. He may not have necessarily been a baby. He might have been a toddler. But uh, upon uh, the arrival of the soldiers, uh, Clara Blinn was shot in the head and her baby was beat over a tree. And the image I used for inspiration in order to capture this was an image of Charles Lindbergh's child uh, once it was discovered. And it was this horrible, you know, kind of... You know, the, the kidnappers dropped the baby 
presumably when they were kidnapping him and they still left the ransom note and wanted the money. Uh, that's another interesting case because on a side note, a lot of people now can, uh, it was called the crime of the century. And then there was this thing over whether or not the guy, the man that was, they convicted was actually guilty of the kidnapping or falsely accused by this other, or not falsely accused, but made patsy by this other man by the name of Isidore Fish. And they found like, I guess some of the money, uh, from Fish, uh, or uh, Bruno found the money tried to use it, didn't, supposedly didn't understand it was the ransom money. But then Lindbergh pointed him out because Lindbergh was personally present on the drop and said that he recognized the man's voice. And he, and then, um, and then uh, you know, they, they found the, you know, some, some of the, the ladder and the artifacts there. His wife argued that he was, uh, according to my mom, his wife argued that he's such a good carpenter, he wouldn't have built that piece of crap ladder that, that broke and, you know, the baby fell from. But, you know, criminals aren't perfect. They often have strange reasoning and inconvenient circumstances uh, for which, you know, things happen. The prosecuting attorney for the Bruno Hopp case, the Lindbergh kidnapping, was H. Norman Schwartzkopf's father, the father of the late, great uh, Gulf War General Storman Norman Schwartzkopf, was the man who prosecuted the Lindbergh uh, kidnapping, and Schwarzkopf loved his father, is very proud of him. This is a; these are two special images. First of all, this is Governor Evans of Colorado, who tried to negotiate with Black Kettle in the months preceding Sand Creek. He kept regularly um, approaching the Indians, and the Indians would go further and and uh, not, and they would refuse to meet with them uh, when they were trying to make peace. Uh, and, and come to some type of agreement. The Indians continued their hostilities. That's why Shivington and his men were deployed. This is a very fine general who I had the pleasure of drawing back when I had time and attention and uh, gave everyone the respect and honor to be featured here. This is someone I pay attention to. This is Samuel Ryan Curtis, uh, one, of the, one of the most important um, administrative heads of the Western theater of the Civil War. He was the man in charge of the battles like uh, um, Pea Ridge and Westport, I think. And uh, he was, this is another officer we'll get into later. One of Custer's obnoxious rivals inside of the 7th Cavalry was Frederick Benteen. And Frederick Benteen would have had a lot of experience under this guy. I don't know how much they personally knew each other, uh, given his high, much higher rank than uh, Benteen. But uh, Benteen was in those battles uh, while Custer was fighting in the Eastern Theater in uh, you know, battles like Gettysburg and so on. This is a rather beautiful portrait of, of Sherman that you have. In, uh, and um, Sherman was a very hard man to draw. He's got a lot of crevices all over his face. But he was someone I had always wanted to draw since I was a little kid. And this was, I think, the first most serious portrait I came away with. Uh, this is a rather great image. It's featured twice in different ways because sometimes I'll modify it and pass it off like it's a, a new drawing. But this is an image of Yellow Nose getting um, shot in the face or smoked in the face at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Yellow Nose received powder burns uh, from from fighting with uh, one of Custer's men in, in, in close hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. And so a soldier dislodged lodged his pistol and blew smoke in his face. Interesting experience when I was actually at the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, one of the reenactors, I bumped into one of the reenactors when I was dressed up like a reenactor and I was in, in the fight. And I just kind of slightly bumped into him, but he had this shot he wanted to get off. And the Indian charged so close, he but he still wanted to get his shot off. He shot the Indian too close and he smoked the Indian in the face with a blank. And so the Indian got it in his eyes. But it was a very realistic looking moment because, you know, you saw something you would have seen at the battle for at one of the moments when the Indians got too close. And the Indians didn't like storming uh, Last Stand Hill until all of the uh, soldiers' weapons uh, were silent because they knew Custer's men still had the manpower. So they tried to get the, the they reined in the arrows and they tried to uh, get Custer's men to... Uh, you know, fire all their shots or, or die before they overtook that, that hill. And Last Stand Hill was one of the last positions to fall at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So 
if Custer was not the last man standing, he was one of the last men standing, uh, or could have been, and that was the last serious knot of resistance before you have, like, the random survivors scurried across the battlefield, in which case the two very last men to die at the Battle of Little Bighorn were a sergeant and, uh, and maybe a private who were found at the river by a squaw who was squatting in the river and uh, uh, next next to one of those wounded, injured men, and she beat them to death with a rock. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, they were they were wounded. They couldn't. You know, and um, they if they had survived a day longer, they would have ran into the soldiers who came to uh, look at the battlefield uh, two days afterwards. Uh, and then we would have had a, a an inside account of the Battle of Little Bighorn, not one of the spurious ones uh, that is often circulated by men like I don't know John Coster, you know, and the History Channel with some of their you know. But you know, hopefully we'll get some better material out there. That's why we got to have our hand on the pulse, and we got to tell the truth and continue to uh, you know let freedom ring. This is a very this is another one, but from the opposite side. Uh, by the name of Sterling Price, and we'll get into him a little more. Hopefully, there'll be more of these lectures. That's one of the next great things I want to do is to go on a book tour and take some of these with me and discuss some of these in more detail. A lot behind each image to tell you, and um, uh, I can't I can't wait to get there. The Sterling Price was uh, the uh, he's a general and he fought for Missouri and a prominent Confederate general in the. Western theater of the Civil War. Oh my gosh. So anyway, I'm flipping it. I, I had some specific topics I wanted to conclude with before I move on from this video. And uh, I was talking about the Battle of Washita. So Custer had lost no more than, you know, five men or less, maybe one man when, uh, and he had captured the Cheyenne village and he had, bur uh, he had burned it to the ground and he slaughtered all the horses. And then he's getting ready to leave, and then uh, Major Elliott, who was also very prominent in the battle, a very great, you know, officer, fighting man, a Quaker, <laughs> he, who was kind of disowned from his family for fighting in the Civil War, like many different Quakers. Uh, he, he goes off on his own shouting, here's to a brevet or a coffin, you know, with his sword in hand. And he takes 20, 20 guys with him, and they get massacred. And uh, this became a, co a huge controversy within the 7th, particularly with Frederick Benteen, uh, who held Custer responsible and liable for those deaths for not going to save uh, Elliot. But Custer was surrounded by an even larger force of Indians after taking Black Kettle's village. And he marched out of there with the uh, women and children and, and even a few male hostages as human shields to avoid, uh, you know, getting massacred. Uh, he sent Captain Myers, uh, one of his men, to go ascertain the whereabouts of Elliot, but Myers couldn't get to where Elliot was. He heard firing, but couldn't get to that position. Elliot was, 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 was massacred. They found the bodies later and determined what had happened. Uh, but one of the theories is that one of his men who had made a brave last stand, and there's a story about it that my friend Joe Kelly likes to relate. Um, there's a story that he might have that Elliot died very close to where Clara Blinn and her child were and that they might have been trying to get them out. That's one of the new speculations that I've heard. Don't know how true it is. Uh, I wish I knew specifically exactly where everyone was in relation to each other on that battlefield. All I know is that Black Kettle was regularly in the company of hostiles and Custer followed the, uh, the footprints in the snow of a war party directly into his village. And I also think that Custer killed one of the first warriors in that battle. Uh, they say that Black Kettle fired a warning shot outside his teepee before trying to flee, but another Indian who actually fired that first shot was an Indian by the name of Double Wolf. And one of the first things that Custer did when he entered that village, and it was actually an attack from multiple directions, but Custer shot a warrior right in the head and then he went to his administrative duties. I'll see you again.